Hello, Star Trek fans. Welcome to Rebinge It. This is the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. My name is Kim. And my name is James. And we are rebinging Star Trek Voyager from the beginning, one episode at a time. Welcome back to the podcast. Today, we are on Season 2, Episode 21, Deadlock. This episode aired March 18th, 1996. Before we talk about this one, anything to say about last week's episode, which was investigations. And for us, it was yesterday. We just recorded (laughs) the episode yesterday. Fresh in my mind, this one. I did enjoy investigations. That was a good episode. Mm -hmm. Even if Tom needs to be a little bit more bloodthirsty when dealing with the Kazon. Yeah, he left too many alive, no doubt. So I have the notes this week, if you are ready. Yes, over to you. In the cold open, Neelix is chatting too closely with Ensign Wildman, who, (laughs) by the way, has been pregnant for like two years. This isn't the only instance of very close talking in this episode. Yeah, there's a lot of close talking, even with the two characters who are played by the same actor. Ensign Wildman starts trying to help Neelix fix some broken things around the mess hall. And then, of course, she goes into labor. I mean, there's no reason for us to show her other than that. What was Harry doing during all of this? Because Neelix complains Harry wasn't helping out. (laughs) Well, he was busy. What's Harry doing that's so busy? Well, she said what he was doing, but I forget what she said. I didn't write it down. (laughs) Apparently, you didn't either. We do learn here that Kess's aeroponics bay has been having low yields lately. I'm not sure if that means anything, but Neelix has been forced to replicate produce. Can't Kess be using that Ocampa powers that makes everything Yeah, the special powers. Well, remember, she only figured out how to burn everything to the ground, so maybe that's the problem. They had to start over after she burned it all. Maybe in her training with Tuvok, it's like, yeah, try not to use that at all. Yeah. Meanwhile, on the bridge, everyone is waiting for the baby to be born, and we're just missing cigars as they're even pacing around the room. (laughs) We learn Tuvok's wife was in labor for four days for one of their kids, which sounds like an absolute nightmare. Yeah. Janeway tells Chakotay she doesn't know if she should be welcoming the baby or apologizing for (laughs) getting her stuck on a spaceship with no other kids in the Delta Quadrant. That was a nice little touch. I like that. But things turn dark really quickly when they realize they've entered Vidian territory and Tom picks up 20 ships within sensor range. Yeah. So Janeway calls for an all stop and Tom says there's a large plasma drift covering most of the territory so they can use that to hide themselves while trying to move by quietly. Really? A plasma drift? This is only one step away from how much trouble you get into when you go into a nebula. Yeah, it's very similar. In sickbay, there are some real problems with the birth of the baby because it has head ridges, which we see later, which have lodged into the uterine wall, which sounds absolutely horrifying. (laughs) Meanwhile, on the bridge, we clear the Vidian system and we get ourselves out of the plasma drift. But now in sickbay, we beam the baby out and into a little incubator, which, why didn't we just do that in the first place? Yes, exactly. (laughs) The little baby with the tiny pointy horns glued to its forehead seems okay, (laughs) though. (laughs) Though there is some kind of chemical imbalance that the doctor seems to think he can compensate for. I do feel on the bridge, when everybody was nervous earlier, Mm -hmm. Janeway missed the opportunity of saying, better get used to this, Chakotay. Your kid's about to be born any day (laughs) now. Yeah, that's true. She could also add that she found motherhood really easily. She just laid eggs. Oh, gosh. She had a whole family. Meanwhile... Tom, do you ever wonder how our kids are doing? Meanwhile, Voyager hits some kind of (laughs) subspace turbulence as they exit the plasma drift. Naturally. And we know it's bad because there's an immediate power fluctuation and the lights flicker. But then the warp engine stall and engines and maneuvering thrusters are all out. We also are losing main power. And Belana says antimatter supplies are being drained and she doesn't know why. It's like they've sprung a leak, but they can't find the crack. Janeway suggests infusing the warp core with repeated proton bursts every 30 seconds to, I don't know, stop it from draining, I guess. Doing some science-y thing, a techno-babbly thing, yeah. There's so much techno-babble in this episode. A lot of Star Trek science. Before Bellana can start the proton burst, though, the ship is hit with something that turns out to be a proton burst from somewhere else, and it causes some big damage. Everything starts blowing up. In sickbay, the baby incubator is losing power just as several casualties enter, and so much has happened, and we're just now cueing the theme song. Right. It's quite the opening. I guess if you're given the choice between entering the Dian space and going through a plasma drift, It's probably a toss-up about which is going to be more dangerous. 
Yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk about how long it would take to go around it. or You know what I mean? It yeah. was just like, oh, yeah, let's just get in that plasma drift. I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, could we go the long way around? I thought a couple of weeks ago we just found that the Vidians, some of them are quite nice. Maybe these ones would be okay. Yeah. The doctor could say, hey, I had a Vidian girlfriend. I think when there's too many of them, it's quite dangerous. Or maybe they're all mass murdering psychopaths. Well, yeah, that is the problem. As the doctor now treats a number of serious injuries, the baby continues to struggle and Kess cannot stabilize her. The ship continues to get hit by those rogue proton bursts, yeah. causing tons of damage. In engineering, Belana just can't figure out where the bursts are coming from. Janeway says they appear to be originating within the ship, and it's like they're just coming out of thin air. And we get the first hull breach. The structural integrity of the hull is being weakened. Harry has an idea to seal the breach, so he runs off. In sick bay, the baby continues to struggle, and it doesn't help that the proton bursts are now impacting the doctor's holographic integrity. Yeah. Meanwhile, Harry and Bellana are running to the hull breach to set up a portable containment field, and they have to climb into a Jeffrey's tube because nothing is ever easy. Nope. On the bridge, we still don't know what's happening. Janeway suggests magnetizing the hull to try and stop the bursts. In sick bay, Ensign Wildman asks the doctor if her baby is going to die, and the doc says not if he can help it, but he is not terribly convincing in this moment. No, no, least convincing doctor ever. Back to the Jeffrey's tube, and Harry climbs down to set up the containment field. Bad news as Hogan, who has been helping them, is injured by an explosion, and Belana tells Harry to hurry up. My thought here was, is Hogan off the show after just two episodes? <laughs> oh, yeah. In sick bay, terrible news as the baby now dies. Neelix tries to console Ensign Wildman as Kess is called away to the medical emergency of Hogan. Yep. More bad news as Harry can't get the containment field up in time and the breach widens, sucking Harry out into space as Bellana tries to grab him. And we've lost Harry. We've lost Harry. And also, wouldn't Bellana be affected here by the vacuum of space? I mean, she's just like reaching out. I don't know. It was seemed a little strange. There should have been a massive outrush of all the yeah. atmosphere from the deck. So in theory, how is she not getting pulled out with it? Unless he actually got his little containment field up. I'm not sure. Oh, so basically as he's getting pulled out, the containment field came up. Okay, that would be a heroic Star Trek exit. Going back to when we originally watched this, did you think they really killed Harry? Well, yeah. I mean, I don't remember if I thought, oh, Harry's off the show. Yeah. But they do kill main characters. It does happen. Yeah. At the same time, we've had some time shenanigans on <laughs> oh, Voyager, yeah. so it could have been a time shenanigan. There's a whole episode dedicated to murdering Miles. Visionary. Why murdering Miles? He gets killed by the phaser once. But he's not really murdered. I'd say putting a booby trap in a oh. panel that kills the person who opens it. That's pretty much a murder. Oh, I forgot about that. Right, right. Okay. Bailana climbs to safety and sees Kess running up the hallway to help Hogan, but she suddenly vanishes in front of Bailana's eyes. <laughs> so Bailana calls the captain and says, Harry's dead, and by the way, Kess just vanished. Janeway's like, oh, too bad about Harry, but what do you mean Kess just vanished? Bailana identifies a rift in the hallway, and when she throws some debris into it, she detects another oxygen-nitrogen atmosphere on the other side of the rift, and she says Kess might still be alive. I was surprised here. Wouldn't you think she detected oxygen on the other side? Mm -hmm. Don't you think someone like Balana, their reaction would be, I'm going to go and get Kess back. Well, maybe, except she also had to save Hogan and yeah. there was a breach right by where she was. Yeah. So she needed to act quickly and do yeah. something about what was right in front of her. And look, she also just watched Harry get sucked out into space. Yeah. So she might have be thinking super clearly. Mm, true. But I would yeah. expect the reaction would be, Oh, I'm getting them back. Maybe that's a, well, a but, Janeway maneuver. But you don't know if she's gone either. Basically, what she's saying is Kess might still be fine yeah. because I found this rift. So there's still a chance to save her, but it doesn't mean you have to jump in right now and save her because you've uh, got to save Hogan. He's right in front of you. True. I will accept that. Belana and Hogan have to evacuate the deck because the hull breach is widening. So she grabs Hogan and gets him to safety. Meanwhile, more bursts hit the ship and the captain is now injured and her hair is all must. She's got a big cut on her face. She's looking extra hot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Janeway gets that smack in her face and immediately we get the awesome rumpled Janeway. As soon as her hair loosens up, I don't know, she gets 10 times hotter. I don't know what happens. <laughs> it's some weird <laughs> thing that happens with Kate Mulgrew. There is something about messed up hair action Janeway. I know. 
Chakotay does manage to magnetize the hull finally and stop the burst damage, at least for a few seconds. Yeah. But the breach is pretty wide, and we learn there are 632 micro-fractures along the ship's infrastructure, and all primary systems are offline. So two vex report. Voyager is pretty much beaten to crap, abandoned ship. Oh, yeah, because he also says the antimatter supply has dropped to 18%, warp coils are fused, and the list just goes on and on. Yeah. And he also informs the captain about the baby. And Janeway does this, like, really stern turn and says, get a team fixing those microfractures. She sends Tom to help the doctor just as they're hit by yet another burst. Right. And she goes flying out of her chair. And now fire suppression is out. Everything is busted. And now they have to evacuate the bridge because there's a hull breach on deck one. And we also get roof beams falling. Oh, yeah. In engineering, they show, yeah, Baylana pushing roof beams out of the way. And and on the bridge. Oh, geez, the beams. <laughs> so as the captain is running to evacuate, she sees like a ghostly image of herself in another version of the Voyager bridge. And then she turns into the ghostly image and our perspective shifts to the much calmer bridge where the other Captain Janeway catches a vision of her ghostly self running to the turbo lift. It's a really cool, effective little thing that happens. Yeah, it does this turn and then you see this perfect undamaged Voyager with Janeway watching herself run across the bridge. That was a really cool look. Yeah, I really like that. Weirdly, Janeway seems to be the only one who saw this. As our story now shifts to the undamaged bridge. Yep. And Janeway says she just saw herself cross the bridge and enter the turbo lift. And she says, I looked like hell. (laughs) No, no, no. No. You looked incredible. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, she looked fantastic. The only thing that would have made it better would have been if she'd had a phaser rifle when she was doing that. No, that's true. Well, Harry is able to detect a minor spatial fluctuation on the bridge. She calls Balana to check on the main sensor array, which is still down. So Janeway tells Harry to modify a tricorder to scan for other spatial anomalies and to go over every centimeter of the bridge. Metric once again, love it. And she tells Chakotay to examine the sensor logs from when they were in the plasma drift. And then she says she's going to sickbay. And down in sickbay, we find a healthy baby Wildman. And we also have a new patient. The Kess that disappeared on the other ship has (laughs) appeared here and is unconscious. That was also very good. And the way she asked, and how's the other patient? Yeah. And then it just cuts to the other cast. There's a lot of really nice little directing touches in here with the storytelling. Yeah, Yeah, because we didn't even explain it. We didn't need to because we saw it happen, right? Exactly. Well, it turns out a cast number two is almost exactly like the cast from this ship, except for a slight phase shift in her DNA. Yep. And this is a big drama. And after an ad break, they wake the second Kess up and she tells them she remembers running through the corridor and then she felt dizzy and then she woke up here. Janeway holds up a piece of damaged conduit that was found near Kess and she says, analysis shows it's from Voyager, but there's no damage to Voyager. And Kess number two says there was massive damage to the ship. So Janeway says the evidence suggests that Kess comes from a different Voyager. Duh. I mean, there's two of them. (laughs) They've identified a spatial rift on deck 15, which might be connecting those two voyagers. And Janeway says, the ships and the people seem to be similar, and we both entered a plasma cloud to avoid the Vidians. Our engine stalled, causing both of our antimatter supplies to drain, and we both decided to emit proton bursts to keep our engines running. But after that, the experiences diverged. So she's figured out a lot in a really short (laughs) amount of time. Well, she is the captain, and she's pretty smart. She says, we started emitting the proton bursts, but the other ship did not. She surmises that the proton bursts are actually damaging the other Voyager, so she calls engineering and tells them to stop. And she says, we need to find this other ship. So I think what we're learning here is we've got like a few Star Trek things here. We've got Mm. like the quantum duplicate that's slightly out of phase. It makes me think of, remember when Geordie and Ro and uh, Romulan end up out of phase on the Enterprise? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Kind of like that. That's a good one. It's really kind of cool. Right. On the bridge, Chakotay says a quantum analysis on the logs showed something funny happened when they hit the subspace turbulence. And we see an image of Voyager kind of splitting into two. Yeah. The subspace turbulence was actually some kind of divergence field, which duplicated everything. A divergence field. That's a new one. Yeah, my notes say, I think that's made up. Janeway tells a story about 
quantum theorists at Kent State University who ran an experiment in which a single particle of matter was duplicated by a subspace divergence. In that experiment, they were able to duplicate matter but not antimatter, so now we realize the two ships are sharing a single source of antimatter, which is why it keeps draining. She tells Belana she needs to figure out a way to communicate with the other ship, and then she says, we need to figure out how to send Kess back safely through the rift. Harry suggests rigging a portable phase discriminator to protect her from the spatial transition, and everybody runs off to do things. They would. Their ship's in nice, perfect condition. (laughs) Right. In sickbay now, we're discussing breastfeeding. The other Kess is watching quietly, remembering the crying of the baby from her version of Voyager. She tells the doctor that the medical systems were heavily damaged and the baby died. This shocks the doctor, and they don't tell Ensign Wildman, which I think that's probably for the best. Good plan, yep. Back to engineering, and Belana is trying to establish communication with the other Voyager, but it's tricky because the molecular signature of the two ships are slightly out of phase. They need the other ship to recalibrate their carrier wave at the same time in order to match these variants. So they emit a signal on all subspace bands to get their attention. On the other Voyager, everybody is in engineering because remember, Deck 1 had a hull breach. And it's all looking trashed. (laughs) Right, and it's just chaos because everybody's running around in the same small space. Yeah. They hear the high-pitched noise, and they find that it has a Federation signature, so it works, ultimately allowing the two ships to communicate with each other. I'm not sure the how and the why matters. (laughs) They managed to figure it out. I think there's a lot of the how is irrelevant in this episode. It's just, it's happening. They just move on with it. I mean, I wrote down a lot of the techno babble. Yeah. But there's still so much more that I did not oh, write yeah. down because it's wild. <laughs> this really is a wild episode for that. Well, now we have this really awesome scene of the perfect Janeway on her well lit ship <laughs> communicating <laughs> yeah. with the must up injured Janeway on the damaged and dark ship. It's really cool. Yeah. The crew on the beat up ship later is debating whether or not that Janeway was a trick, but she did manage to convince them that it was real. Yeah. So they've decided to try and recreate the subspace divergence field and then force the ship somehow to merge back together. But the damaged Voyager only has enough power to try this once. And if you notice, the plan involves using the deflector dish. We're going to use the deflector dish like you always say. The answer to most problems in Star Trek is the deflector. But it's very bad news because there's still 17 minutes left in this episode. So this is not going to work. (laughs) you you got to admit, that is pretty funny when you watch these things. Yeah. That is totally one of the ways to look at if the plans are going to work of where you are in the episode. And Star Trek is very much the show for this. You're maybe 20 minutes in and you're like, there's no chance this is going to work. Yeah. Well, we do that in every show. I'm sure everyone does. We did that the other day when we were watching Agatha all along. We paused it to see how much time was left and was like, oh, yeah, that's that's not going to work. Yeah. Yeah. And Voyager is kind of like this. You'd get to maybe about 20 minutes and you'd be thinking, it's going to get worse, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it always has to get worse. (laughs) And, you know, Prodigy was a bit like that. The thing on Prodigy is with the short episodes, things would happen so quickly. Yeah. Very rarely did you feel like they were dragging something out because it just like, thing would happen, it would get worse, they would solve it, right? It was like bang, 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 bang. Oh, yeah. Well, the pacing on Prodigy was shockingly well done. Right, right. So a few minutes later, we're ready to try this whole plan. We fire up the deflector dishes and initiate the field, and it almost works, but they somehow overshoot and go farther out of phase, so we have to abort. On the undamaged ship, Belana says, we're going to be completely drained of antimatter in 30 minutes. So Janeway says she's going with Kess through the spatial rift to talk to herself on the other ship. This idea is crazy. (laughs) What are you doing? That was also Kate Mulgrew doing that wonderful stern Janeway, where she says, bring another one. I'm going with her. I know, but the idea is crazy. First of all, you don't know that you're going to get out of this. What if you end up stuck over there and now you've got two Janeways and you're leaving your other ship without a captain? I mean, it's it's wild. I mean, we talked about this before that we're just not careful enough (laughs) sometimes. Well, you said that about Janeway, if she can be reckless. But I think that's a perfect example, though, of a Star Trek captain. They're not willing to sacrifice crew members to do this thing. It's like, it's potentially dangerous. I'm going to do it myself. Yes, it's reckless, but it's the essence of a Star Trek captain. I think Picard sends Riker. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's true. He probably would. Maybe not movie Picard, but TV show Picard, yes. 
I would agree with that. I think movie Picard is going through, but movie Picard in a lot of ways really was a very different character. Uh, yeah, he was the hero. <laughs> he, yeah, I guess by that point, he was absolutely the hero. Well, it's like watching Kirk, right? I mean, I talked about how I always found Kirk to be the big hero of Star Trek because the original series movies were my intro yeah. to Star Trek. When I go back now and I watch the show, I'm like, <laughs> he is a jerk. I do not like that guy. <laughs> But he was great in the movies. Yeah, he's a very different character in the movies. Yeah. It's a different thing you're doing with a movie. Yeah. Especially if you're trying to get a new audience. You need him to be the hero. You know, he couldn't be the jerk that he was on the TV show. Right. Well, now we have some kind of device on Janeway's arm and Kess's arm, kind of like what Gwen wore in the last season of Prodigy. (laughs) Hmm, interesting. Is this another nod back to (laughs) an earlier show? Probably. I really enjoyed watching that in Prodigy of all the nods to the law that came before them. Right. Well, Kess and Janeway are able to safely walk through the spatial rift into the dark and damaged Voyager. And in the damaged engineering, the must Janeway with a giant bruise on her head <laughs> has a private chat with a completely unmust Janeway who has just appeared. I think this might be because of the old narrow four to three aspect ratio on TV. Mm-hmm that they have to put Janeway right next to the other Janeway. And it looks like they're super close talking. Yeah, they look like they're two centimeters apart and they're like breathing on each other. Yeah. So I guess this is something now we've become maybe more used to, that with 16 by 9, we get these much more natural looking scenes, you know, without the camera having to back all the way out to show them talking. Right. You can do this sort of close conversation without being forced to literally stick the two of them in this tiny frame. Yeah, yeah, that's that makes sense. So unmust Janeway, I'm going to refer to them as unmust and must. <laughs> you could just use hot Janeway. <laughs> well, they're kind of both hot Janeway. Yeah, it's hot and hotter Janeway. Unmust or hot Janeway says, it's just like that Kent State experiment. The duplicate atoms couldn't occupy the same point in space-time for very long before mutual annihilation. Oh, so even more pressure. No big deal. Yep. Must, or hotter Janeway, suggests doing the opposite of merging the ships and instead dividing them. But that turns out that's a bad idea because it will disrupt the antimatter supply and kill them all. They also discuss evacuating the people from one ship to the other, but this will alter the atomic balance and kill them all. So every (laughs) everything ends like that. It's it's like in Shaun of the Dead, when at the end of every plan they're having a cup of tea. This is at the end of every plan they're all dead. None of them will work out how you want in the end. So then the must or the hotter Janeway tells the unmust Janeway to return to her ship, and the unmust one realizes that the other is planning to self destruct her ship. Yes. Rumpled Janeway is going to blow up the ship. Right. So the rumpled one is like, why do you say that? And of course, the unrumpled one says, well, because that's what I would do. (laughs) It's a brilliant scene, really, of not just the dialogue, but also Kate Mulgrew acting with herself. It's really, really good. I do think, though, shouldn't this be a major concern? They've already run into one set of unintended consequences when they tried to (laughs) use the deflector and merge the two ships. Right. Couldn't you find, oh... When I blow up the one ship, it mutually annihilates the other one. I, it, yeah, I would expect that would be a huge risk yeah. because the proton bursts from one were affecting the other. So why wouldn't an explosion? Right. So at this point, the unmust Janeway asks for 15 more minutes to come up with another solution. And then they wish each other good luck and part. Also worthy of note here is the unmust Janeway does say she was not willing to let her make that sacrifice yet. Right. Well, I think they both recognize what they don't want to do is kill them all. Yeah. Right? I think they're hoping they can merge somehow back together. But if that doesn't work, one of them might have to go to save the other. One of them's got to go. I'd forgotten how good Janeway arguing with herself was. (laughs) Yeah, it's really good. Back on the less damaged Voyager, they have an idea. But before anything can happen, the news gets so much worse. A Vidian ship has dropped out of warp and is approaching. And neither ship of Voyagers have weapons or shields. This is like the joke about Russian history, and it gets worse. We talked about a few episodes ago, I think it was the Dreadnought episode, which I found really stressful to watch. And then also the Prodigy episode I had to watch at that time, 
where Zero was making a potentially life-sacrificing move to try to save right, them. And it right. was just super stressful. And I was watching those two on an airplane, and it, which just made it more stressful. So last night, as I was trying to watch this episode, because I don't remember anything, right? And so it's like the yeah. first time I'm seeing it in 20-some years. I had to turn it off. I'm like, this is too stressful. I don't know what's going to happen. I hate the Vidians. They're going to come and start <laughs> killing people. i like, I can't. I got to turn it off. And I did, and then I went back to it later <laughs> to watch it. And then I was like, I, I wanted to fast forward, but I can't because I was the one responsible for the notes. Maybe I should have. I should have just said, you know what? You do the notes for the last 10 minutes, <laughs> and I'll just come back at the end. I, I think this is an episode of Can Janeway Get a Win? This is like a Galactica episode. Oh, God, can it get any worse? Yeah. We're actually seeing members of the crew getting killed. The ship is being wrecked. Well, it's so bad, right? The baby died. We lost Harry. Yeah. And like so many bad things are happening. And then the Vidians start boarding the ship. It's like, what is going on? This really is. Everything is going to hell. You're all going to die. Yeah. Well, on the Vidian ship, they recognize that Voyager is trapped in some sort of spatial flux. Yeah. You'd think that would be something maybe to avoid. But no, instead, <laughs> they fire on Voyager. And the weapons array on the once healthier Voyager ship is completely destroyed. And the Vidians yep. move in to board Voyager by cutting a hole in the hull. So it's just getting worse and worse. This is some great effect shot here. And you know how much I love all the space stuff and I feel they could do way more of it. But I guess budgets and things back then. That Vidian ship, not only does it look really cool. Yeah. But it's huge. It's huge, yeah. You see, it actually dwarfs Voyager. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what's in my notes. Well, the Vidians board. I don't understand why Tuvok is telling Janeway they're cutting a hole in the hull. They're going to be boarding at this point. There isn't a security team waiting. Yeah. And then just use their phasers on everything that comes through. Or gas them. Do something. Oh, yes. And put some neurogene gas yeah, in there. Because ne or is it neurocene? Neurocene. Because we don't have weapons. We don't have shields. We don't have anything. We don't have power. I'm sure we have gas. Right. Well, the Vidians board and immediately start taking organs from the crew. It's super grim because we see Tuvok and Tom go down. Yep. We really need to deal with these Vidians. These guys are terrible. But they found a nice one. The oh doctor got a girlfriend. And speaking of the doctor, in sick bay, the doctor takes the baby from Ensign Wildman to hide her, saying he won't let them take our baby. That's weird, but okay. <laughs> Well, the doctor had already shown that he felt like he was partly responsible for the successful birth of the baby. Yeah. He's very full of himself. And on the bridge, we learn that over 300 Vidians have boarded Voyager. Jeez. That's very quick. Yeah, because that's double how many people we even have on Voyager. So the more damaged Voyager, you know, the other one, calls to say that they are not being boarded. The must Janeway from that ship says, we don't think they can detect us. So she offers yeah. to send security personnel over through the rift. But you know what happens next. The <laughs> unmust Janeway says, I will destroy this ship so you can survive. <laughs> she says she's going to send Harry and the Wildman baby through the rift first. It's like, it's only fair. It's like, is it? That's <laughs> so strange. <laughs> and then she says, get your crew home. And the must Janeway says, I will. Okay. Bolana had determined that five people could go through. Yeah. Shouldn't this Janeway say, Harry, grab three other people and the baby, get them onto the other ship? Yeah. But don't take Ensign Wildman because that would be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> the two moms. Oh, that's terrible. And the one baby. Don't do that. Don't do that. But seriously, grab anyone you can to get them to safety. If you have a limit of five people. I know. It was weird. Yeah. It, and especially as you know, Voyager is already undercrewed. Bring some other people over. Oh, and make sure they're not marquee if you can help it. I think this would have been better if it had happened sort of under duress. Like if they were in sick bay, all trying to protect themselves or whatever. And she just has yeah. this sort of urgent thought at that moment and just sends Harry or pushes Harry and the baby through something like that. Oh, but in this scenario nice. where she kind of thought it out, it seems very yeah. weird. Yeah, because everybody right. else is like, uh, I'm sorry. What about me? Right. I would think Janeway, I mean, remember, Janeway's been in this position before where she was going to blow up the ship to stop Dreadnought. 
Yep. And she wanted to get everybody in escape pods. Yeah, she doesn't care about anybody here. Yeah. I guess this is different because anybody who survives at this point is at risk of having their organs harvested. Yeah. Which is pretty brutal. And then just left to bleed out. I mean, that is bad. Oh, I, I agree. She can't use that. Yeah. But this is a way of getting them off the ship. Agreed. Anybody Harry could grab, bring them through. She tells Harry to get the baby and go. And Harry is like, well, uh, and she's like, no, just go. And he goes, yeah, OK, sure. <laughs> Don't ask me twice. And then she initiates the self-destruct sequence. This oh. is so grim. And and also, so many times we see multiple people have to give the okay for the destruct sequence. Nope, not on Janeway's <laughs> ship. Just takes Janeway. Just her. It's the second time in the last couple of weeks where she's done it. Right. And I have to say it, Kim. Blow up the damn ship, Jean-Luc. Yeah, she is no, yeah, she has no <laughs> concerns. <laughs> okay, if those roles had been reversed... Lily, Alfred Woodard, would have walked into Janeway's ready room and Janeway would have been sitting there saying, you better leave, Lily. I'm just going to blow up the ship. <laughs> I already started it. <laughs> yeah, I started it five minutes ago. In sickbay now, the Vidians are just basically trying to kill everyone. Hey, a lot of good organs there. Good harvesting day. Harry sneaks in, takes a couple of them out, takes the baby. While they're busy trying to steal Ensign Wildman's organs, I don't know. This scene was hard to watch. It was just, it was horrifying. What's strange here is I think it shows they know, I mean, Janeway knows how bad the Vidians are. We have enough yeah. information of just how terrible the Vidians are. So why would they even try and save that Vidian shuttle? Why would you even go out of your way with this race who are mass murderers? I think it's good that we have this direct problem now. Maybe that will yeah. help change it. Well, no, it won't because they're all dead. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but Harry will be able to yeah, Harry debrief. Thought. Must Janeway of the Vidians will just kill everyone. That's true. They look at you as meat. That's a good point. Well, the Vidians arrive on the bridge and Janeway says, why, hello. <laughs> Welcome to the bridge. <laughs> and then the freaking ship blows up, taking the Vidian ship out with it, just as Harry crosses the rift successfully with the baby. Oh, that scene was superb. It was that good. took me right back yeah. to the search for Spock. Because one of the henchmen comes into the bridge and then looks at the computer and you can see it's counting down two, one. Yeah. <laughs> it was, that was great. Well, somehow the previously heavily damaged Voyager is up and running again after the ad break. It was all superficial. Oh my God. There were two hull breaches. There were those 400 micro fractures. Tons of people were injured. No big deal. They're fine. Well, the lights are back on and there's no sign of any other Vidian ship, so everything's fine. If you noticed earlier when they talked about the number of people who were injured, yeah. they did not mention that Harry was killed. Well, maybe because she just learned it. I don't know, but you're right. Tuvok didn't mention it. We've lost so many people. Oh, yeah. And um, the guy yeah. stands next to Tuvok. That Harry guy. Oh, my God. Tuvok tells Janeway the bridge will be available in three days, and Janeway says she's not sure how much longer Baylan is going to tolerate her standing over her shoulder in engineering. <laughs> that would be annoying. Yes, especially as Janeway is an engineer. You'd probably be second-guessing yourself all the time. Of like, uh, uh, is, am I doing this the right way? Is this correct? Yeah. Is this the most efficient way of doing it? No, it would be annoying. Well, now we have a weird chat with Janeway and Tuvok that I think was supposed to be meaningful. Yes. He asks if Janeway would have given the same self-destruct order that the other one gave. She says, yes, but she says, part of me also sees the other captain's point of view, yeah. which was very confusing. Tuvok says, you could say that you were both the doubter and the doubted. <laughs> okay. I'm sure that made sense to someone. It sounded good in the writing room. I literally had no idea what in the hell they were talking yeah. about here. Because, of course, she would have made the same decision. She was the same person. It was Janeway. Yeah. It, I, I didn't know what we were trying to accomplish. Before we leave this scene, we do get some great Tuvok lines here. As he says to her, I do not envy the paradox of logic you were faced with in that situation. That's a great Vulcan line. I think it's the Vulcan version of... I empathize with your predicament. Yeah. It it was such a disappointing scene. Oh, completely. Because, yes, there were a couple of interesting things said, but I felt like maybe they wrote that and the plot changed or something in the yeah. story. I don't know. Like, maybe it was filmed out of order, but 
this scene completely lost the plot of what had happened you know, in the rest of the episode. That's a really good point. Maybe it was something like this was the scene that would, was already in the bag, and then they adjusted the plot during filming and didn't go back and redo it. Because yeah, uh, what is disappointing here? I was going to talk about this in overanalysis, but let's talk about it now. I feel this would have been a great scene between Tuvok and Janeway, who is the person she bounces things off that she can talk to about the guilt she's feeling that the other Janeway was the one who made the sacrifice. And in that position, would she have done the same thing? Yeah. Knowing that the other one could have done it. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, there was something there that they could have had a good conversation. Exactly. But yeah, it's in a moment of sort of self-doubt. If it came down to me, would I have done that without question like the other Janeway? Right. Apart from Tuvok's one good line, we got what? <laughs> what? What was this? No, it was weird. I, yeah, it was very weird. Yeah. In my opinion, that's the only miss. The only real miss in this. Well, if it had just been me who thought the scene was confusing, I would have assumed I just missed something. Yeah. But since you also thought it was confusing, maybe it wasn't us. <laughs> yeah, I think they queued it up for great potential. And then yeah. it was a damp squib. Here's the other weird thing in this episode. Okay. Because now we see Ensign Wildman with her baby. And... We are somehow going to pretend like she didn't just grieve the death of her baby 10 minutes ago. We just like substituted a different baby and she's like perfectly fine. I mean, that is exceedingly broken. My note here says, God, that poor woman is going to be traumatized beyond imagination. Oh, that PTSD is not going away because you handed her a different baby. Yeah. That is absolutely crazy. And by the way, there were a few other people traumatized by that as well. Remember Kess, she was having like those yes. PTSD yep. flashbacks to yep. it. It doesn't just go away because you gave her a different <laughs> baby. That's not how trauma works. Right. Oh, my God. I mean, Kess was there was when bad. the child died and was trying to help the doctor save her. I know. I know. It was crazy. Yeah. That was very strange. Maybe it's because of the difference in this show and Deep Space Nine. And here, because we're trying to be episodic, everybody's fine. But you didn't have to do it here. You could do it, yes, in the next episode, right? And just like everything's yeah. normal. We we've just accepted it. Because they did that in Deep Space Nine all the time, right? Something terrible would happen to Miles <laughs> and he's fine the next episode, <laughs> yes. right? But that's not what they did here. They made it fine like by the end. Right. They could have just acknowledged it. They didn't have to make a big scene of it. Yeah. And so Wildman could have just been like crying or something as she looked at the baby or, you know, anything. But they were just acting like, well, isn't this great? We got a new baby. <laughs> we found you a new baby. That's great. Well, it's like, come on. <laughs> Well, now Harry and Janeway are walking down the corridor, and Harry says it's weird to have changed ships somehow and still have the same captain. And Janeway says, Mr. Kim, we're Starfleet officers. Weird is part of the job. <laughs> Truer words have never been spoken on Star Trek. <laughs> it's the job. Oh, it's what happens. 100%. And that's how the episode ends. The last, like, three minutes of this episode are insane. Yeah. I would argue that it should have ended sooner. It should have ended before the conversation between Tuvok and Janeway and before they showed Ensign Wild. They shouldn't have shown any of that. Yeah. It should have just ended when the ship blew up because we knew what would have happened. Oh. I don't think we needed to do any more. Yeah. I think trying to put a bow on it was not a good idea. That would have made a really fascinating ending. And no spoilers, but I think there's another episode that they actually do mm. that where the episode ends and we cut to Voyager flying through space, heading home. And that's the wrap up. I think you're right, because I thought that's what this episode was. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about. Right. Anyway, I guess now we do over analysis. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any other over analysis? Well, the first one I have is I find it funny that anybody in their right mind would try boarding actions against other starships. Yeah. Because they're incredibly dangerous to the ship doing the boarding. How do you yeah. know the other ship couldn't hit self-destruct and blow you up? Yeah, you didn't. And you didn't know if they were armed or you didn't know anything. Yeah, it was dumb. Right. It reminds me of like one of the naval historians talking about boarding actions in the Age of Sail. And the big risk in doing it was if the ship you were boarding caught on fire. <laughs> because <laughs> oh. if that yeah. happened, both of you were very likely to go down. So this seems like an incredibly dangerous move, but I could see how the Vidians are really desperate for organs. 
True. So they're absolutely prepared to make those kind of risks. Yeah. They, remember the Vidians who tried to tell us that they didn't hurt other people to get the organs? Mm. Oh, that's right. They only harvested them from dead people. Yeah. After we kill them. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately <laughs> after we kill them. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's alive who we harvest from. Next thing. Yeah. So is there a dead Harry body out there just floating around in space? Yeah. Floating around in the plasma drift? Yeah. No biggie. <laughs> There's so many weird things about this episode. Oh, yeah. And that is one of them. Next weird thing about the episode, the baby Wildman. Yeah. It has horns on its head. <laughs> yeah. How did that not kill Ensign Wildman? Well, it tried to. Babies move around. I know. Well, it's maybe not. It would have made more sense if, yeah, if it had developed that after yeah. birth and not, yeah, before it was born. But, uh, but also, I mean, that was like a two-year-old baby. <laughs> that was a big baby. Well, I suppose they could be soft. So at this point, they haven't actually formed into real horns. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I guess that's the explanation for why it took two years for her to have this baby, (laughs) (laughs) because it wasn't human. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, But it has been a lot more than nine months. And I still don't understand why we didn't just beam the baby out in the first place. I don't know. Right. Whatever. I think that falls under the problem of transporter technology is too much of a crutch for writing. You try and avoid yeah. using it because otherwise yeah. it, you could use it for everything. That's true. It's like the eagles in Lord of the Rings. And they're also always trying to convince us that women want things to be natural. And I, I call BS. <laughs> Get that thing out. <laughs> Especially when it's got horns that are trying to kill me. Okay, next thing. So if the second Voyager is slightly out of phase, mm-hmm. Why did the proton bursts affect it? Well, I have a lot of questions about that because also at the end, if it's out of phase and the Vidian ship couldn't see it, is it invisible? (laughs) Ha, good point. Yeah, I I don't know. The only thing I can imagine is because the antimatter was shared. And so they were trying to impact the antimatter, right? Yes, to stop it from leaking. So it wasn't so much the proton bursts as what they were doing to the antimatter. Interesting. That's how much I know about science. It seemed a little bit hand-wavy for me. Of, of oh, well. Some yeah. particles could affect the ship. Other particles could not affect the ship. I assume it. that's why. It just It's something to do with the antimatter sharing the same space. And yeah. that was causing the problem. Plus, blowing up the warp core, wouldn't that affect the antimatter? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't blowing up the ship affect it? Yeah. Yeah, there's some weird stuff going on there. I don't yes, know. Yes, yes. Balan is in engineering, waving her hands, going, it'll be fine. It'll work out. We're good. What I will say about this episode is the idea of what they were doing was great. Yeah. But, oh my goodness, do we have some <laughs> hand waves to get us through. Oh, yeah. Very true. Um, My next point, we already talked about it, of Harry should have grabbed some people and just brought them through into the other ship. That would have been good. And then, oh, and then my final point is, I wonder what was happening to Lon Sutter during this. I'm picturing that, you know, the force fields went down. Mm, Just ran out and was killing people. Yeah. They should have sicked him on the Vidians. Yeah, transferred him across. Well, I don't know, because I don't know what's going on in there. If he's actually picked up the power to meditate or something from Tuvok, although I know Tuvok said that would wear off, so I don't, I don't know. But yeah, maybe he got out and he was just killing people left and right. Although that was on the other ship. So I don't know. We let Lon Sutter out. The Vidians are yep. all dead. Yeah, we locked ourselves <laughs> into the, uh, onto the bridge and we just let that <laughs> yeah. guy out. We're fine. Exactly. Eventually we had to gas him and put him back. Oh, good one. And that wraps up my not very serious over analysis. Well, I have a few points. Okay. Was the doctor overly confident with the baby? Yes. The one that... That died because he didn't pay it enough attention. He was just basically leaving it to Kess yep. and being like, oh, I'm a genius. I, you know, I did this thing to say whatever the imbalance was. Oh, yeah. And then the baby died. It's like, dude. I was thinking about this and I have a couple of theories. Yeah. The first one is the machinery basically was breaking down. Mm, because of the attack. The doctor is fantastic as long as his equipment was working. True. And also he was starting to fail. Yeah, that's, that's also okay. true. Mm. The next thing I was thinking was maybe... Because of the spatial rift and the using the transporter, the baby was affected differently. Maybe. So yeah. what was wrong with the baby was different in the, the beaten up Janeway ship. Thinking about it, he could also have been distracted. Well, he was distracted. Yeah. 
I mean, he had so many people he was dealing with. Yeah. You'd think a good hollow program would be like running multiprocessors and could easily run separate programs. Well, we're not that smart about that stuff generally in terms of how we write him. But I do think <laughs> that's what they were trying to play up, yeah. right? That he was overly confident that everything was fine and he was just, you know, basically telling yeah. Kess what to do. But he wasn't doing any of it himself because he was over trying to help all the other people who were injured. It's not that yeah. he wasn't doing whatever his duty was, but it just seemed like he was negligent with the baby. Which, I think that's going to mess with Kess. Interesting. I didn't see it that far. I think I saw it as he was let down by the equipment. Well, this again, I think, suffers from what happened with this story, which was we wanted to kill one of the babies in the story and have the other baby survive and whatever, you know, so... Not sure we did all the right things to make that happen. Oh, so you should have made made maybe the equipment failure more obvious, or yeah. the doctor disappear and the equipment fail and Kess. Now that would have been better, actually. That's horrible trauma for Kess. Yeah, yeah, that's she's true. left there dealing with you know without a doctor, without the equipment, trying to save the baby with her own skills. Well, Wow. But, but he could have like phased out and then they repaired him and brought him back and it was too late. Oh, okay, there that would have been yeah. OK, yeah. because this way it seemed like his yeah. ego was too big and that's what caused the problem. And I don't think that's right Ooh. for that character. I don't really think that's yeah. what they wanted to do with it. But that's how yeah. I saw it. I can see how you would see that. I mean, that is definitely one way of reading it. Mm. That's a horrible way of reading it. But... <laughs> this episode was really, really dark. Yeah. yeah, I found it really dark and tough to watch. Yeah. Well, the conversation with Janeway and Janeway was really, really good. And partly just the the acting, but but also yeah. I think they handled it appropriately yeah. where they were each in charge and neither wanted to take any nonsense from the other one. And I really liked that. And they both wanted to make the big sacrifice. You know, oh, it was just yeah. really good. I did enjoy that. <laughs> what was the line from Janeway? Don't make me put you off this ship. Yeah, she's like, I'll call security. You know I'll do it. And the other <laughs> yeah. one's like, mm, yeah, because I would do it. But the conversation with Tuvok and Janeway should have been better. We already talked yes, about that. Yep. That was a missed opportunity. Yeah, oh, agreed. Yeah. Now, my next point is, and we've talked a little bit about this, but yeah. they identified Kess on the other ship as being the same as their first Kess, right? Yep. Except right. the DNA was somehow out of phase. Slightly out of phase. Well, now you've got Harry and the baby on this ship from the other ship. Yeah. So... They're slightly out of phase. Ah, okay. Are we going to put everybody back somehow? And again, like I said, if the Vidians couldn't see them, can anybody see them? I have a theory here. How are we going to get ourselves back in phase? The destruction of the other Voyager forced them back into phase. Oh. Well, that's a hand wave, but I'll accept it. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) That was the assumption Mm. I made from it. I mean, they didn't spell it out, but I think that can be inferred. Okay. And it would make sense, I guess, because if they couldn't occupy the same space, maybe that's what was keeping them apart. Yeah. But then once one of them was gone, the other one could resume. Phase back in. Natural. And, yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Hand waved. Accepted. Still what happens to the other Harry body. Yeah. Well, that's still somewhere. Oh, my God. Poor Harry. Well, I mean, we're just going to pretend like everything is fine from here. Yep. Nothing's wrong. Wildman lost the baby. Belana saw Harry die. <laughs> A whole ship of people who are just like you just blew up right in front of you and took the Vidian ship out. I mean, I feel like we could have at least acknowledged the deaths of all these people, but trying to (laughs) pretend like it's no big deal. I feel like it's sort of it takes away from the gravity of it and it almost makes fun of it. And I, I don't like that when Star Trek does that. I remember this was one of your complaints about the earlier series of Deep Space Nine of they would lose a lot of crew. And I wasn't it up to the ship? was the first episode where we actually addressed we're losing people who are friends yeah. and colleagues. And Cisco talks about the guy who could play the trumpet. They're actually yeah. people. And this is a little bit of going back to that maybe earlier Star Trek of uh, the cannon fodder. Yeah. Everybody but the lead is disposable. There's a lot of reason for it. It's meant to be an uplifting show. Yeah. And it's meant to be episodic so that you can watch them independently, right, without having to yep. worry about yep. what happened in the previous one. All of those things are true. But we don't need to act like the painful stuff's not painful. Yeah. You don't have to, like I said earlier, you don't have to bring it up again in the next episode, but at least acknowledge it here. Because just handing that woman a different baby after <laughs> she just <laughs> suffered the loss right. of her baby, right. that is just not how that works. And I don't know, it cheapened it. 
I thought, at the end. Well, anyway, <laughs> those are all my points. Uh, nothing to say about women in the future. It was a little weird that the doctor kept saying that the baby was our baby. That was weird, but I don't know, strange. And then in Leadership Corner, I would only say that on this show, Janeway, I'm not sure if, it, if this is how it would be if she were yeah. in the Alpha Quadrant, but she is the one who she accepts her responsibility that she has to make every tough decision. Yeah. She doesn't put that burden onto anybody else. She does it. And in this case, right. she had two Janeways and they were both trying to make a tough decision. <laughs> I actually really like that. I thought that was the best part of the episode. Well, I think Janeway in the Alpha Quadrant would have other captains to fall back on or to rely on. And most importantly, would have the command structure to rely on of admirals and all the way up to the Federation Council. Right. She could blame other people for bad decisions. She doesn't have that here. (laughs) She she could get advice or position on something from these other people. Whereas she is literally, the joke goes, there's her and God, or Q. And that can really mess with you. We've talked about that before. It would be great if she had someone she could talk to, even if she made a fake person in the holodeck, just so she could have a conversation. Because otherwise you end up either thinking, well, you're the one who's right all the time. Yeah. (laughs) Like you were suggesting. (laughs) Or the other way, which is that you start to doubt every decision that you're making right. because we ended up here because of me. Am I the problem? So, wow, you know, that's, that's a yeah. tough one. Look, leadership is tough <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but if you don't have anyone to talk to, it's really, really hard. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move to rating. Thumbs up, thumbs down or neutral. What is your rating? I really enjoyed this episode. This is, I think, from a science fiction story standpoint, great episode. Yes, it had its flaws. It had its miss. I would have loved a more in-depth conversation with Janeway and Tuvok at the end. I think that would have been a fantastic bow to wrap this episode up. It was grim. It was everything just kept on getting worse. But it was still a good episode and I did enjoy it. So thumbs up. Definitely worth a rewatch. Well, I disagree. I think, and not on your rating, I disagree that it's (laughs) rewatchable is what I don't agree with. Because I think... Like that episode, Children of Time oh. in Deep Space Nine. Yeah. An excellent science fiction episode. Really interesting, really different. You get to the end, you're like, dang, that was good. And then you rewatch it and you go, well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> yeah. Why were there no crossovers of Trill and Klingon when they made a whole big point about Dax and Worf getting together and having children, yeah. but yet they were only the so-called pure Trills or pure Klingons? Like, that doesn't make any sense. I think the same thing happened here, which is this is a cool science fiction story where the two ships sort of diverge and they have to find yep. a way to to get back to being one ship. And of course, uh-huh. the obvious things don't work. Then, oh, they're attacked and it just couldn't get any worse. That's all really interesting. But when you examine it too closely, which you tend to do in a rewatch, then I think it starts to fall apart. Really? Like all the things that I mentioned, I guess. And that terrible conversation at the end between Tuvok and Janeway was dumb. The way we tried to pretend like it was just okay that we have a new baby. Yeah. You know, it's just like, I don't think it's rewatchable. Really? But I agree that I think the sci-fi part of the story yeah. is good. I think I find it rewatchable because I like the science fiction story aspect of it. Maybe a little bit more than the flaws with the episode. I think the sci-fi part is good. I think the performances are good. Yes. Kate Mulgrew in particular, yep. very good. Kess, very good. Yep. Even Baylana is good. Right? There's lots of good stuff. Yeah. But I think the disregard for a real human reaction at the end uh-huh. kind of wrecks it. Uh-huh. I don't want to give it a thumbs down because I do think there's a lot of good stuff. So I'll just neutral it. Wow. And I just absolutely don't think it's rewatchable. Yeah. I'm bummed out about it because I yeah. I think there's lots of unique good things in it. Yeah. It should be better. And I wish it was. But you just can't kill people and <laughs> pretend like it didn't happen. You just can't. You can see the potential in it and maybe a little bit more work. It could have been a classic. What an opportunity to rip my heart out and they didn't do it. They said, ah, here's a new baby. What? <laughs> Yeah, that one is a little questionable, yes. I mean, my note does say, wouldn't this mother be absolutely traumatized? Absolute trauma, yeah. Well, there's a potential for another idea here. The other Wildman gets killed as well, on the messed up ship. So the prime Wildman and Harry both escape. Yeah, there were lots of things they could have done differently, but they didn't. (sighs) 
Well, I think this is one of those rare times that our views of an episode wildly diverge, and we are not having many of those. True. It's not like season one of Deep Space Nine. (laughs) No, that's true. I don't want to keep beating on it, so I'm just going to move on. Well, that wraps up Season 2, Episode 21. Come back next week for Episode 22. In the meantime, if you'd like to send us your own over-analysis of this or any episode, I wouldn't mind hearing what other people have to say about this episode because maybe I'm overreacting. <laughs> you can email us at rebingeit at gmail.com. You can reach out to us on threads, Instagram, YouTube, Blue Sky, at rebingeit. Or you can join the Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Star Trek TTM podcasts. Thanks for joining us on the Rebinge Star Trek Voyager podcast. That's it for me. And that's it for me. Mm-hmm.